Okay, Nina. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, both watching the live stream and uh, here on Zoom. <laughs> I would like to welcome you to this uh, last Coffee with a Writer of the semester. And our guest today is Tom Sitto, who is there with a beautiful painting of somebody fishing in, is it the Savage River or? Yeah, that's the Savage. That's, cool. uh, that's actually, a that's me in the background. Ah. Um, it was painted by Brian Klein, um, who's no longer with us. That's actually the last painting that he ever did. Wow. That's Sorry beautiful. to say, um, but I've always used it as a background since, so. Well, lovely. Well, thank you for um, agreeing to be our uh, writer, our featured writer. And just to say a little bit about you, um, Tom Sitto is a writer of fiction and essays. Anything else, Tom? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, the bio I sent. Um, I was uh, the director of uh, right. <laughs> an organization called City Dialogues in LA. We did uh, collaborative shows. Uh, and some of the stories, um, well, most of the stories that I'm going to read um, have, uh, have started from that. Um, they are... Uh, short stories, uh, okay. uh, two, two pages or less, and they're designed to be read uh, live because I don't know how you feel about it, Nina, but listening to somebody read a 10 page story live is uh, a bit of a marathon sometimes, <laughs> depending on the writer and the story. Well, um, I'm really interested in hearing about this collaboration because you collaborated with other types of artists as well, I understand, so. Um, yes. Yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But sure. for right now, I also want to say that uh, Tom's work has appeared in Connotation Press, Disorient, Mosaic, Riprap, and other journals. He's a professor, professor of English um, at Potomac State. And another thing I'm also very interested in hearing about is he's a brewer for North Branch Craft Pub in Kaiser. So lots of interesting things coming up. Guys got to have a hobby. <laughs> yeah, you have many, it <laughs> seems. <laughs> so before we get going with your reading um, from some of your writings, I would ask Jen to do the honors of thanking all the organizations that have made this possible. I'm happy to. So the uh, the work of the Center for Literary Arts is supported by the Allegheny Arts Council, by the Community Trust Foundation, by the City of Frostburg, and by several offices at Frostburg State University, including the Office of the President, the Office of the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and also the Department of English and Foreign Languages and Literature. Uh, we're grateful that you're joining us today. And of course, these Coffee with the Writers uh, couldn't happen without the goodwill of the writers who join us, but also the uh, goodwill and volunteerism of Nina Forsythe, uh, <laughs> your host. So, um, so we're glad you're with us. And uh, just a quick note that uh, I know that you know this, but a quick note that if you keep your mic uh, off while not asking a question, it will help to improve the quality of the sound. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. Um, before we get going with uh, Tom's reading, I just want to mention um, that I got my second vaccine dose yesterday. So if I'm not making sense, you know, maybe just kind of jump in and <laughs> take over. <laughs> okay, Tom, uh, have you chosen something that you're going to read to us? Sure. So we get um, a flavor uh, of your writing. Yeah, I'm gonna read from uh, a project that, that kind of stalled um, when I became a full-time professor. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's called Argentina. I'm gonna read some of the excerpts from it. I think I, I sent some of them to you. Um, and uh, the point of view is from uh, a child um, growing up as an American expatriate in Argentina, uh, which I did. Um, so I'm gonna read, uh, this is uh, the beginning of the book, I've just started to go back into it. Um, this is not one I sent you, but this is uh, kind of an essay slash 
poem uh, called Tango. It traces uh, the Andalusian dance of flamenco into Argentina. So it's been a while since I've uh, read live. So um, if my voice shakes, that's why. <laughs> it's called Tango. <clears throat> when flamenco dances, she is the most beautiful woman in the world. I recall still long ago following her through the narrow brick streets of old Madrid, her red satin dress glistening in the heat of the Castilian sun. I chased her into a Tosca then, everything in silhouette as my eyes adjusted to the cool darkness. The guitar began to rumble as she pulled me to the stage. Castanets snapped in my ears, a wave of her dress, and I was the romantic dreamer Quixote. A wave of her dress, and I, the doomed Toro, charging into the sword. She stomped her heels, and the floor became my drum. There was nothing but her dark eyes, her black hair, her white skin, as she swirled about me with the violent grace of a storm. I was her prey, overwhelmed by her gypsy passion. She was glorious, proud, a brazen flirtation, capturing me in her brutal rhythmic liberty. Together we danced the seduction and I let loose my free will and final surrender to her primitive soul. Within that moment, I alone was her conquest, in the end, left thirsting for her memory. But something happened to Flamenco when she landed on the shores of the Rio de la Plata. While my back was turned, she was swallowed by Argentine deceit and transformed into tango. She passes by me now on the dirty streets of La Boca, and I almost let her go. She has bleached her hair, but still I recognize her dark roots. Gone are the festive ruffles of her fire and fire red of her dress, exchanged for the morose sophistication of a black sheath. I follow her through the back alleys and past the docks. Men whistle and shout as she moves away. She creeps from shadow to shadow, doorway to doorway, as if afraid of the midday sun. In this sleazy dockside tavern, the music begins its sinister hypnotic rhythm and she approaches me with a look of indifference. Even in her embrace, there is a manner distance, a restraint within her passion, as if she is saving herself for her next partner. No longer does she stomp the floor in wild abandon, no longer do her hands swim gracefully through the air. No longer does she wave her dress like a banner the playful seduction has become somber consummation. Her pride is now conceit. I leave spent and broken, more customer than lover, not wanting to return, but knowing I will. Argentina rains down, silver in my dreams, taking my conscience prisoner in her manicured fist. She begs to remind me of her European blood, holding up pictures of the conquistadores to electric light looking back upon our days in old M Madrid, speaking to me in Italian, German, and English, and boasting of how the new Buenos Aires Cafe Society rivals that of Paris. No longer is she a backwater settlement of a conquering empire. She is an empire of her own design. Proud of her pale white skin, her imported heritage, she glides upon a new dance floor. This country seduces with promises of unfulfilled destiny, she stands before crowds and holds her open hands to the sky, calling the peasants, brothers, sisters, children. She throws them 100 peso notes from her second story back balcony. Libertad, libertad, she cries, but I know she is a liar. I have seen her sneak away under cover of darkness to sip tea from porcelain cups on the estancias of the landed gentry. I have seen her dance with foreign men. In reverence, for her conquered native soul. I myself have chosen to turn my eyes to the south. I have felt the cold sting of Patagonian winds. I have stood on the rocks of, at the edge of Tierra del Fuego and watched the storms out over the straits, chasing Magellan to his grave. I have listened to the Incan myths and seen the condor fly over the peaks of the Andes. I have seen the remnants of the Guiacuru nation of the Southern Plains and heard the ancient Quechua spoken in the northern promises, provinces. These things she cannot hide from me, no matter how seductively she moves. For here on the Pampas, the horseman still tames the wild horse. And here on the Pampas, 
the Pampero wind still bends the grasses northward. And here on the Pampas, the land is still sown with mestido, mestizo blood. And here on the Pampas, there is still the enduring gaucho. And here on the Pampas, the gauchos don't tango. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Welcome, Jen. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. That's really interesting. What made you decide to personify flamenco and tango? Uh, that was uh, the subject of a city dialogue show. I was working with uh, an artist named uh, Ann Bridges Lindquist. Um, and uh, we had worked together the year before. Um, and there was in Long Beach, California, uh, a bar where they had uh, flamenco dancers every Friday. And we went there um, and eventually uh, she kind of encouraged me to get up on stage and dance with one of the dancers. They pull somebody out of the crowd. Uh, and eventually that became a subject. And uh, so I did a little bit, bit of research on the dance and and there it was. And her paintings uh, reflected that for the show. So tango really does have its root in flamenco. I didn't know that. Um, I don't think it does. Um, but I used, uh, I used flamenco um, just kind of as a metaphor for um, the colonization of Argentina um, and how Argentina, uh, I mean, I, I left there when I was six, seven years old, so I really don't have that much of a memory. Um, but um, it was always uh, called and still is called a very European country, very proud of uh, that as opposed to uh, uh, celebrating its uh, origins it's indigenous people. So that be just became a part of the book. I don't know why. Uh, and it's a subject of a few of these. It's so just it's, a big fat metaphor. It's part of the Argentina book? Yeah. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about um, the city dialogue? You said you were the creator and director from 1996 to 2004. Yeah, and it's a collaboration um, between writers and other kinds of artists. Yeah, and that was that was with Anne. We were both grad students at Cal State Long Beach and MFA programs, um, and I think we were getting bored and looking for something to do because, you know, we we'd go to class and she would do what she did with her paintings, and uh, I was um, I was in workshops twenty four hours a day it seemed, so we wanted to get outside and start doing something with our work instead of reading it in groups. Uh, so we came up with a collaboration um, and it just happened, it was happenstance. I, I was wandering through the halls one day looking for artists to put in our literary journal. Um, and we just started talking about uh, doing a collaborative show and one thing led to another. We, we hooked together uh, writers, mostly from the MFA program um, and uh, artists from the Cal State Long Beach MFA program, uh, sculptors, the, the whole nine yards, painters, uh, and just started doing yearly shows. Um, and it ended uh, at um, the LA Muni, uh, the Municipal Art Gallery at Barnstall Art Park. Uh, and that was, uh, that was a pretty big show. Um, Janoyne Adams was part of it. Uh, uh, people from Frank Zappa's band came and did the music. It was it was a weird experience. Jer Jerry Lachlan uh, was involved. So, it, it, and then I moved out here and, you know, crickets, so. <laughs> Has it continued after you left? Uh, no, but it's uh, it's taken form. Uh, actually, one of the one of the artists that um, that was in one of the early shows. Uh, eventually ended up with me. I was, uh, I was faculty at, uh, at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, I was a lecturer there and he, uh, he started doing similar shows there, which was uh, fine with me. Nobody owns that. And uh, the more people, uh, the more 
people get into collaboration, uh, uh, the more agreeable I am to it. So uh, the more the merrier. So this show that you did, um, how did it like integrate the arts and writing? That depended on the, uh, that depended on the groups. Um, for me, uh, each time I worked with, uh, I worked with painters um, and the paintings went along with uh, the writing that I was doing uh, and vice versa. Uh, and so when we do a show, um, we'd, uh, we'd put together a book for the show and, and give the book out with, with the art in it, as well as the writing. So people would have the writing and, and the book. And we do uh, reading standing in front of uh, the particular piece that uh, we wrote for. Uh, okay, so they some, speak to each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, some, uh, some got, uh, some integrated the words a bit more into, into uh, the art itself. That was uh, a matter of how the artists worked as well. Cool. And you said that the per personification of flamenco and tango was part of the this collaboration that you did. So were you given like a prompt or what? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the first, uh, the show always had a theme. Uh, the first year, the theme was, uh, I think, words to image, image to word. Uh, the second one, which Tango was from, was called Passports. Uh, we went a little international. Uh, so that's when the Argentina stuff started happening. Um, and for Barnstall, we just called it City Dialogues at Barnstall because it was, it was big enough without a theme. <laughs> You didn't need a central organizing theme. <laughs> no, we just, we just, um, I, if, I don't know if, uh, well, you can, you can look up Barnstall, um, you can Google it, but it's a, it's a huge gallery. Um, one of the primary galleries in, in Los Angeles and it's run by LA Cultural Affairs. So um, we just, uh, we were happy enough to be attached to Barnstall. So we called, called it City Dialogues at Barnstall and just let people fly. Lisa, are you familiar with it? Um, I'm, I'm not, but I'm going to look it up. <laughs> cool. Uh, I think it was in 2004. It was a long time ago. So um, this has been dormant for a while. But I, I moved out here in 2007 and I've just been doing other things, I suppose. What brought you out here? A job. Um, I was looking to get away from Southern California. My wife and I wanted to get the heck out of Southern California. Um, it's just too many people. Um, and I was uh, aiming for Morgantown and landed at, uh, at Potomac State. I'm glad I'm at a small college, not a big one though. Um, I, I was working at Cal State Fullerton full time uh, and that's about 25,000 students. And uh, I like I like a smaller space. I'm more comfortable. Did you also have larger classes then when you were at Fullerton? Uh, no, my classes were all, all writing or uh, survey classes of uh, liberal studies. I, I taught upper division liberal studies classes. Um, so classes 20 to 25. No big lecture halls for me. Mm -hmm. And at uh, Potomac State? Um, our comp classes, uh, writing classes are uh, capped at 20 and our lit class is 25. So uh, it's not too bad. Yeah, 20 is not too bad. 20 is manageable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I know that what you sent us, um, you had quite a few excerpts from Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, is it kind of like a work made up of short stories or yes. is, okay, interesting. Yeah, it's all linked. 
length short stories and they're not they don't run from one to the other there's usually um if anything a reference in one to something in another story they're very loosely uh, they're almost linked by um by illusion you know I, I just kind of allude to something in another story and that happens uh are they all from the same point of view no there's some um there's some that are written uh, post-Argentina. Uh, in fact, uh, the last one of them I published, I published in Disorient. It was uh, a reflection with my brother and I driving around Manhattan Beach, California. So I'll read that last if, uh, if it comes up. Well, speaking of reading, do you want to uh, read another piece from Argentina? Sure. Um, Uh, in the book, um, <clears throat> and in real life, uh, uh, we had, uh, we had a, a live-in maid and uh, caretaker um, down there, uh, Esther and Pedro. Uh, and in the book, the boy becomes more enamored with uh, the maid, um, who's pretty much a nanny as well. Uh, and this is uh, this is about that, and and I think uh, the kid starts latching on to the culture down there because he hangs out with the stairs so much. Uh, this is called Oedipus. I am standing at the edge of the casita roof, ready to jump into the deep green of the pool when Esther leans out the window and looks up to me. It is a hot day; the roof tiles are burning my soles, so I jump before she can manage a protest. As I fall past her, I can hear her laughing. And when my feet come to rest on the bottom of the pool, I am laughing too. I look up and watch my air bubbles rise, then chase them to the surface. Que bravo, Tomasito, she says, as I climb out of the water. Her thick forearms drape across the windowsill, sandwiched between the rough hewn wood and the weight of her resting bosom. As I approach, I study her Indian face its roundness accented by sharp cheekbones that rise up under almond-shaped eyes and fade past her temples into braided black hair. She is whiling away her day off, sipping on a bowl of mate, a strong native tea steeped from local herbs and imported coca leaves. Get us, she asks, as she offers me the bowl. I take it from her, cupping it in both my hands and study its smooth pear shape its ebony wood surface inlaid with swirling ribbons of silver. I take a sip through the silver straw and she squeals when my face pinches in disgust. Vamos, she says, almuerzo, it's lunchtime. I step through the door and she dries me with a kitchen towel, then motions for me to sit at the table. The table is covered with baskets and pots, each painted or woven with strange patterns, circles, triangles, squares, diamonds, joined into curious puzzles. I grab the nearest pot, turning it over and over in my hands, tracing the shapes drawn into the belly with my finger. Across the room, there's a gray felt bowler hat with a feather poked into its band hanging on the coat rack, and with it, the rainbow colored wool poncho that I see her wearing to market sometimes. In the black and white photo that hangs on the wall, she is wearing a hat and poncho and standing beside a frost white llama. The llama's black tongue is stretched out of the side of its mouth, twisting like a snake into its ear. And Esther is doing her best to imitate the animal with her own crossed eyes and extended tongue. In the background, the Andes of Bolivia rise to the top of the picture frame, leaving no room in the photo for the sky. She sets a bowl of locro, pumpkin and squash stew in front of me, and then points to the picture Yama spit, turista, she says. I notice now in the background of the photo stands a man who is sneering as he wipes his cheek with a handkerchief and Esther and I laugh together at the llama's rude gesture. As I dip into the stew, I hear my mother calling from the big house, but I am warm here now and I don't want to leave. I want to stay with a woman with the ink and eyes to walk with her down the gold paved streets of the lost cities. I want to trace the Nazca lines with my footsteps, 
and pray in the Mayan temples of the sun. I want to be there the next time the conquistadores are dragged to the bottom of the lakes of Tenochtitlan by the weight of their armor. I want to peel back the layers to expose my Indian skin. I want the Yankee in me to go home and leave my copper spirit to the scattering breath of pagan gods. Oedipus. <laughs> um, so for those of you who have joined um, since the beginning, I just want to encourage people to jump in and ask questions or make comments or anything like that, because this is a conversation. And as I mentioned at the very, very beginning, um, I got my second dose yesterday, so <laughs> I'm not going to be the greatest conversationalist today. So I'm depending on you all to jump in and uh, carry some of the conversation. <laughs> Well, uh, Tom, actually, um, hop in here. Uh, the, the last little bit of that last piece kind of points to one of the questions that I have as I'm kind of hearing you read these stories. Um, you know, you remark on the um, the speaker as being a boy. Clearly, it's written in the voice of kind of an older an older iteration of the boy. Yeah. Do you see this character? Um, you know, this the speaker. Uh, Kind of working through ideas of colonization and how his his position might be kind of a colonial position in some ways, right? Given the uh, the kind of fixation or or being enamored of of the maid, uh, you know, in, in that last piece. So so how do you see kind of uh, the the work grappling with ideas of colonization? Well, I I think I see the character um, as living in two worlds. And because he's young, um, he doesn't have the cynicism of uh, an adult. Um, the cynicism that I have now, for instance. So he's, uh, he looks at things with a sense of wonder and wonders why they are that way, I think. Um, so he's got, uh, at least for the time that he's here, uh, a foot in both worlds. And he's he's uh, kind of juggling, I think, in his kid's mind, uh, which one he wants to belong to, which is, I think, um, I, uh, my, uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, we've always talked about it. Um, and it was a, a different experience growing up in a foreign country. I moved down there when I was, what, six months old. Um, so it, it left uh, quite an imprint on us. And in retrospect, when I look back on it now, um, with all the studying I've done with, uh, I've, I've read a lot of Native American mythology and history and somehow that kind of shaped that character when I started writing him. Um, I, I just think the innocence is what comes up. He wonders why things are the way they are. As we're older, we come to conclusions, but he ha he doesn't have them. I think that's probably a good way to get at the subject matter that you have there, but do you ever worry about things like cultural appropriation? Um, yeah, but I'd never claim to be Argentine. <laughs> um, and the kid is definitely an American expatriate. Um, and I, I have wondered about that in the past. Uh, in the past, uh, with the exception of one time I've published under a pseudonym. Um, so that uh, gives me uh, a bit more of a cover to write about whatever I want. Um, but I, I don't see myself as appropriating anything. Uh, I see myself as uh, observing and reflecting, at least through this character. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm not wandering around with uh, with a tattoo of Argentina on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a good way to approach it, I think. So do you have vivid memories then? I mean, you were there for about six years, um, but you were very young. Yeah, well, I'm old now, so the memories... Uh, yeah, I have I have some vivid memories, but most of them have uh, 
just kind of grown into stories like these. Uh, I just use as, as a base to pretend like a writer does. So, um, but I, I remember the schools. I remember speaking Spanish. I remember um, our, our vacations to Bariloche and, um, and I've been down to, excuse me, I've been down to Chile quite a few times uh, in the last 10 years. So I've, uh, I have gone back into Argentina actually to fish out in Patagonia. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the memories, yeah, they're, they're just all fictionalized at this point. I'm making it all up, <laughs> really. They, their memories are malleable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you can use them to serve your art. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's uh, it's not nonfiction. That's for sure. It's just uh, yeah, all the construct. When you do write nonfiction, what do you tend to focus on? Um. Wow. Uh, I think, like most uh, nonfiction writers, I, I focus on things that I'm trying to. trying to find meaning in um, and it's just uh, something that happens out of the corner of your eye um, and you try and make sense of it. Um, I've, uh, I've done quite a bit of nonfiction. The last thing I published uh, was uh, Iceberg Theory. Uh, that didn't go over well. Um, you can still find it up on, uh, up on uh, Connotation Press. Um, I have I have another, if, if you'd like to hear something else. Um, sure, it'll give us a flavor of uh, that other part of your writing life. Yeah, if, uh, if you wanna hear another, I have, um, can I go ahead and read this? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah this, is, uh, this is called Moses. I, 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 um, for a while, I was uh, building houses, doing remodels, and one of the people I worked for, we worked for um, a lot of people in the Hollywood scene. Um, and I did uh, some work for a guy named Andre Bohan, um, who was uh, a producer um, back in the golden age of Hollywood. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, this is called Moses. It's uh, about working at Andre's house. <clears throat> I'm just finishing the north wall when I hear Andre shuffle up behind me. From the sound of it, he hasn't put his teeth in yet. There's a slight lisp in his clipped Yiddish accent when he speaks. Come to the kitchen, Thomas. I'll make us some coffee. I rest the roller in the bucket and turn around. Morning, Andre. How are you feeling today? Good, he says. Good. But I can tell he's lying. His smile shows gaps, and he is shivering even though it's 80 degrees with the sun still rising. I wipe, I wipe my hands with a rag and the drops of wet paint smear into cloud shapes across his forearms. You can wash up in the kitchen, he says. I have been here all summer. First, it was the roof on the garage, then bookcases in the library. Today, I paint. Lately, for some strange reason, I've been considering the replica of Michelangelo's statue of Moses, which sits by the front door of this house. I've decided that he was wrong that Moses wasn't sturdy and muscular and scowling. Moses was more like Andre, humble and bent with age, thin white beard, shaking hands. I'm thinking of this as Andre works his way across the patio towards the kitchen door, thinking this as I follow him. Andre makes Turkish coffee, refuse, refuses to make it any other way. And I sit at the table and watch a ritual that by now has become familiar the grinding of the beans to a powder in an old brass hand grinder, measuring the perfect amount into a metal pitcher filled with water. He strikes a match and a flame jumps from the burner, wrapping its fingers around the bottom of the pot. As he sits down, he slides a piece of paper over to me, a director's guild ballot for the Academy Awards. Do you want to vote for me this year, he says. I haven't had time. He did this yesterday and the day before. The aphasia makes him forget. So I hear the same stories over and over. I miss the old days. Did I tell you? I was one of the first to do talking pictures. 
it was out of default, really. I was the only one around the office who could write a decent story. That's how I started. I couldn't believe it, a little Jewish immigrant kid like me. And now you're voting for the Oscars, Andre. I was nominated once, did I tell you? He points to the poster on the wall, faded by the many days of sun it's seen. The boys of Paul Street, it says, nominated for two Academy Awards. I'm sure you haven't seen it. We lost to some Gable picture. I can't remember which. He is playing with his hands again, pinching the skin and watching as a bruise forms. One day he went on about how, the, how thin his skin has become, how it bruises so easily. Don't get old, he told me. The body fails, then the mind. Watching him now, I realize how angry he is with age. In the future, I will return here to visit. After the next stroke, after the liver shuts down, he'll be asleep in the rented hospital bed. His only activity will be watching the cars drive past and up into the hills of Hollywood, wondering where they'll stop. But for now, he's all right, so I keep him going. Did you ever know Marilyn? When she was just starting, before they got, before they got to her, we had the same agent, so I met her a few times. She was very nice, innocent, beautiful, but you could tell there was something about her. He squeezes his eyes shut and begins to laugh. I know what's coming next. We had the same agent as Reagan. Did I tell you this? He was such an idiot and a terrible actor. And now look where he is. You know, I was in my agent's office once. When I got up to leave, he grabbed my arm and pushed me back into the chair. Please don't leave, he says. And I ask him why. Ronald Reagan's out there, he says, and I can't stand talking to him. He's so damn stupid. I love the Reagan story and so does Andre. His arms are crossed, holding his sides, and he's laughing. So how's the book going? As I ask this, I realize I've made a mistake. He stares down at the tabletop and shakes his head. It's so frustrating, Thomas. I can't remember from one day to the next. I spent all last week writing a chapter and then yesterday I found another version of the same chapter in the desk drawer. He becomes silent now, shuts his eyes. And as he begins to cry, I notice that the coffee is boiling over onto the stove. Now that was a true story and I just wanted to document it. Um, he was a sweet guy and uh, he left quite an impression on me. So I wrote I love that. that. He really captured not only him, but also this the relationship that you had with him. Yeah, that, that was an interesting that was an interesting summer. Yeah. So did you did you vote? Did you take no. his ballot and vote? No, no. Uh, his son, uh, his son's some producer now as well, but his son ended up uh, coming over and and helping his dad vote, but. Um, he would do that kind of in a joking way. Um, and he, he did the same joke every day. You want to vote for me this year? You want to vote for me this year? Um, and there were a bunch of, at the time we watched videotapes and there were stacks of videotapes so, on his TV. So, but no, I did not. It would be a good story to say it did, but. <laughs> when you, when you write it again, you should change it. <laughs> mm. Well. Moving on to other things. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would be a very different story. <laughs> I mean, it could lead in some interesting directions as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, and he always told that Reagan story, um, and um, well, not to get political, but I was not a fan of uh, uh, of Ronald Reagan, so. Um, that tickled you. <laughs> I, I always got a laugh out of it. <laughs> I was going to say something. I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, yeah. Um, about drawing from life for your writing. You know, like even your fiction, you draw from your experiences in Argentina, for example. Yeah. So now that you are a brewer, which I'd like to hear a little <laughs> more about, <laughs> Has that entered at all into your writing or the people you meet as a brewer and maybe also um, as a fisherman? Like, does that enter your stories? Um, or your well, as, as a brewer, I'm just starting. Uh, we have a pub in Kaiser called the North Branch. 
Um, and I've been working with, uh, with a local guy for past three years, trying to get it together. And our brewing equipment just arrived well, on Thursday. So uh, by the summer I'll be brewing, but I haven't, haven't really written about that yet. Fishing I have. Um, in fact, the last, uh, the last thing I published, and it made me not want to publish after a while, um, was on Connotation Press, and it was about fishing with uh, my brothers and my father, who were um, very overbearing, staunch Republicans, and I'm not. Um, and uh, the story was based on some of that difficulty, and uh, it's the one time I published under my own name, and they found it, and uh, it, the results weren't uh, weren't very positive. So. Are you estranged you as a result? You can read yourself on connotation if you want. <laughs> Were you estranged from them as a result? Yes. Uh, as things that go close to the bone like that can be tricky. But sometimes enough is enough and you have to speak up. So I did and uh, I was willing to do that. And uh, on the on a positive note, anytime I suppose your your work has that strong an effect, um, you know you're onto something. Yeah, yeah. So if if you're pissing off a lot of people, um, you're either really bad or um, really know how to use a knife. Uh, words. <laughs> so it's one or the other. I don't know. <laughs> I have a question, um, and it's it's about what you're reading. Um, it's actually two questions. I'm always interested in what writers are reading these days. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you're reading that you love? It's all I want to know. <laughs> um, I keep going back uh, to a couple of things. I I'm a nut for Raymond Carver. I like Carver's stories very much. Oh, um, you couldn't have said anything better. That's great. I'm a nut for Raymond Carver. Did I mention that? Um, I I really like uh, Sherman Alexi too. Um, and uh, another favorite uh, would be Flannery O'Connor. I just uh, just brilliant stuff. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, the Hemingway. Um, documentary on the fifth, uh, but yeah, those three work for me. And usually, it's uh, usually it's things that I'm I'm reading for my class. Um, I, I teach a lit class, short story class, usually uh, once a year. Uh, but lately, I've been uh, going back into James Baldwin, um, and James Baldwin was just so brilliant. When you read one of his stories, it's like every line is quotable. You just can't understand how someone could be that good. Um, so every time I read Baldwin these days, especially something like Sonny's Blues, it just, how do you measure up to that? There's just no way, so. Right. Well, it's funny just to go back to Hemingway because you talked about fishing and, mm -hmm. uh, Every once in a while, I teach Big Two-Hearted River. I am I don't fish. Yeah. I like to be outside and near water and seeing fish, but I'm not. It's just not a thing I do. <laughs> have you Have you read that story? And and if so, what do you think of it? Yeah, but uh, but to be honest with you, it's been years since I read it. Yeah, it's been years since I read it. Um, <clears throat> I uh, when I I went to grad school late. Um, when I was 30, I think. Uh, and my teachers there were all latching on to people like Tobias Wolf and, and Raymond Carver. And uh, some of my professors actually were drinking buddies with Bukowski. Um, so I kind of went into Carver's work and he does actually address fishing quite a bit as well. Um, so I, I just like his style. Uh, but it's been so long since I've read the Hemingway stuff. And uh, 
I, I would say that Hemingway was um, kind of the inspiration for writing this short flash fiction that I do, um, specifically in our time, uh, when he wrote those shorts for In Our Time. Um, I th thought, that's really interesting. I wonder if I could do that. And I, I bet that would be a lot better to do with these readings than read something from a 10 page story, which usually it's an excerpt and it's out of context. So um, that kind of gave me some direction. Hemingway did, but uh, yeah, I haven't read him in a long time. His oblique, I do, this is I, really, sorry. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, I, I do use uh, Hills Like White Elephants. Yeah, Quite speaking of oblique. <laughs> yeah. That's a great story. Those students respond to it so powerfully. Yep. And there's a there's a remake of it. Do we use that word in fiction? There's a <laughs> newer version by Russell Banks. Has anyone read it? No. Black black man and white woman in a dark green rowboat. And he sort of takes hills like white elephants. Yeah. There's no there's no fishing, but there's water. Actually, there is fishing. <laughs> Oh my God, Tom, you got to read it. It's short. It has fishing. Uh, it's, 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 it's fun. It's interesting. The reason I asked about the Hemingway story was not to put you on the spot. It's not like a, you know, your oral exams. It's just um, for people who don't fish, it's like going on a camping trip. Yeah. Kind of with Hemingway, uh, although you don't get punched or anything. So it's okay. Um, <laughs> And he really, he makes it so visceral and real. Um, and it's a, it's a longer story too, but. Yeah. Well, he, he was a bit hyper-masculine. So it might be because his mother dressed him in a dress until he was five years old, but uh, we'll never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is one of the things that sort of puts me off a little bit about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's, that was his focus in, in so many ways. Uh, the Nick Adams stories are uh, like Indian camp. Um, yeah, they're, uh, they're interesting in that, in that respect, especially with the father-son relationships. So and I still remember Short Happy Life of Francis McComber, um, but yeah, there's some that still stand out. How about Flannery O'Connor? What draws you to her? I see her stuff as uh, as parables in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. If you take uh, Good Man is Hard to Find, especially uh, the opening where she, uh, she quotes, um, something about uh, St. Peter and the dragon, I think. Um, we all go to the keeper of souls, but we must first pass the dragon and along comes the misfit um, and the, the dark woods in the background and uh, the misfits on a mission. And my, my question always to, to my students is, uh, who's the hero of the story? Does the grandmother find grace fin finally? Uh, who's, who's the one that only, uh, who's the one that, uh, stays true to the mission. Um, the grandmother is uh, a scary figure, but she finds that one moment of grace at the end, but the misfit um, knows what he's out to do to set the world back in balance because Jesus threw it off balance. Now, I, uh, I was raised Catholic, um, and I think oftentimes she's pointing out um, some of the hypocrisy in people that claim to be religious in a lot of them. Often, work. yes. <laughs> so, um, that, that always strikes a chord with me. Yeah, it's been a while since I read her, but there's one like about a preacher on a bus. I can't remember. Um, but that one, I think, uh, I need to go back and read her again. <laughs> I actually saw a couple weeks ago a documentary. I caught part of a documentary on PBS about her. Um, I want to track that down, but uh, I haven't seen much simply because she died so young, but she was an interesting character. Yeah, yeah. I get the feeling not that easy to get along with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Lisa and I just had this entire conversation on a walk recently. <laughs> it was like everything you all said. <laughs> and I think, is it wise blood? Is that at least of the, the uh, Nina that um, with the preacher on the bus? It's, it's it an, could be that one. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about oh. the bus part, but, I, but it's definitely about a preacher who doesn't believe in anything. That's his, that's the premise. Mm -hmm. He preaches about nothing. He doesn't believe in anything. Right. <laughs> I wish that's one about the Bible, <clears throat> the Bible salesman. Oh, that's a. <laughs> Good, good country, country people, people. Oh. yes yes yeah <laughs> that one is oh my god that's a turn <laughs> you know she's very funny she I is mean, she yeah. is she's brutal and and vicious and i was not raised catholic but i i can see that there is an uncompromising vision there but she's funny isn't she she is yeah <laughs> and you would not want her to write parlor it is unforgettable oh my god <laughs> Joy Helga. <laughs> I was just thinking the uh, go back to go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. Oh my god! Is a line right that I find myself thinking sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you say it when you drive. Then go back to hell. <laughs> and then and then when she cries later and she says, "I am not a warthog from hell." Oh, uh, Flynn O'Connor's great. You know, I mean, I think. It's hard to read a lot of her all at once. Yeah. It's hard to read a lot of anything all at once. But yeah, I think uh, you need to let it settle with you before you move on to the next one. Right. There's there's a lot to think about. And usually a lot of gore. Or yeah, there's that violence. too. Yes. Yeah, she's <laughs> yeah, pretty uncompromising. If the story requires gore, it will have gore. That's right. It's like the Chekhov thing. Yes, exactly. There's a bull in the first sentence. It will gore someone by the end. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, do you have any like humor in your stories? It's, it's something it seems to me that it's either something that you just, that comes naturally to you or it doesn't. It seems like it's really hard to, um, say, I'm going to write a funny story or I'm going to work humor into this story. <laughs> I have never tried to write a funny story. Um, but I, I think uh, I, I see Jennifer's here. She might, she might attest to this. Usually what comes out in stories and in real life is some sort of sarcastic, cynical, poignant, sometimes comment about things. And that's usually what comes out in stories um but i i'm not much of a comedian so uh no i've never tried humor i just occasionally a, a snappy line i never used to write funny poems but i think in the last few years there are just certain things that I'll just start with a first line and it just seems to require taking the poem to some absurd lengths. Yeah. <laughs> and I've yeah. just been enjoying that. Just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I sent you a found poem uh, that was supposedly, I don't know if this is true, um, on a park sign in British Columbia um, about bears. Did you read that? I didn't read that one. No, that doesn't sound familiar. Uh, let me see if I can find it. It's um, Fort Steele Campground. Um, I actually have a picture of this. I think it's photoshopped, really. Um, but I, all I did was shape it into a poem. Due to the frequency of human bear encounters, the BC Fish and Wildlife Branch is advising hikers, hunters, fishermen, and any other persons that use the out of doors in a recreational or work related function to take extra precautions while in the field. We advise the outdoorsmen to wear noisy bells on clothing so as to give advanced warning to any bears that might be close by so they don't take them by surprise. 
We also advise anyone using the out of doors to carry pepper spray in case of, a, of an encounter with a bear. Outdoorsmen should also be on the watch for fresh bear activity and be able to tell the difference between black bear feces and grizzly bear feces. Black bear feces is smaller and contains lots of berries and squirrel fur. Grizzly bear shit has lots of bells in it and smells like pepper. That's the one funny thing I've ever written. And I didn't write it. I, I stole it from a Photoshop sign and just, it's something fun to read live. So um, <laughs> there's my attempt at humor. <laughs> well, you, uh, you have a nose for it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, I stole it. So in fact, uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a picture of, of the sign on my wall. So um, one of those found poem things. Is that still, is that still acceptable to do found poetry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it, ha it captures that kind of unexpected thing. I think often found poems, what makes them work is the juxtaposition between whatever it is that um, was written and you know, something about the background or, or even the, the way the words are ordered. Um, sometimes yeah. it's, it's not that funny until you break the lines in a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I wish I had an example. <laughs> yeah, the people that ran my MFA program in, out in Long Beach, um, they called themselves the stand-up poets. It was... Uh, Elliot Freed, Charles Webb, Ray Zepeda, Jerry Laughlin. And with Laughlin especially, there was always some sort of punchline to his little short poems. And uh, you'd think, well, that was silly. And then it kind of grows on you. And um, he, was, uh, he was an interesting guy. But uh, they would always, um, at readings, uh, read poems that had some sort of hitch or punchline at the end. Um, and uh, I think uh, Charles Webb put out a couple of books on stand-up poetry um, from the West Coast. Uh, and those, uh, those are the, some of the people that I studied under. So that kind of made its way into, into things, I think. I think, yeah, for live readings, it really does help to yeah. get some humor in there. It's hard to sustain something really serious or it, to read a whole bunch of really serious poems in a row or like a yeah. long serious piece though so with narrative it's it works better but i find with poetry it, it's good to interleave it with some humor or something that has a yeah. punch at the end <laughs> you could you can probably find it on youtube but uh i remember watching a video of uh sharon olds i think she wrote a book of poems about her father dying from cancer. It was really, right, yeah. really heavy, but I watched her read one of the poems and uh, in the poem, it was talking about how he was asphyxiating on his, um, his breathing tube. Or... Yeah. His breathing tube and um, something about choking on phlegm. And she took, I don't know if she did it on purpose, but she took a break in the middle of reading the poem and picked up a glass of water and drank it. And I thought, ew, <laughs> I'm not going to do that serious stuff like that. Yeah, it, uh, for some reason that comes to mind right now. But um, sometimes readings get uh, a little heavy. It's nice to have something light to read. So, um, yeah. Do you have something uh, there that you'd like to read for us? Sure. Um, let's see. Oh, this this has some humor in it. Um, uh, but this is from a story. Uh, actually, I think you've seen this story before. I I, I never ended up publishing it um, at the the writers group at uh, 
Stephen Dunn's house. Um, but this is the, the middle section and it, uh, it was also from a city dialogue show. Um, and uh, the story was called MacArthur Park. And I, I kind of integrated all the words from Jimmy Webb's song into the story. So some of them are here. Uh, but this is the middle section. It's called uh, Zealot. <clears throat> I love it when the witnesses of Jehovah knock upon my door. Instead of chasing them away with a curt no thank you, I invite the dialogue. Something deep in my agnostic heart takes a sadistic pleasure in refuting their philosophy. It used to be easy. I had standard questions. I would ask who wrote the Bible? Wait for them to reply that God did, of course, and then proceed to lash them with rhetoric. I would badger them with the open challenge, is God a woman, and delight in their hasty retreat. But I soon became a marked man. Every week came a new visit from a witness better prepared. I would notice them huddling on the sidewalk and watch the chosen one march up to my door. I began to lose ground, lose battles, and realize that if I were to survive, spiritual impulse, will to victory, I would need to do some research. I combed every issue of the watchtower they handed me for any dogmatic weakness. I read up on various philosophies and found comfort in the existentialism of Kant and Sartre. I found freedom in the skeptic words of Hume. God can neither be proven nor disproven. The man became my Messiah, his words my ammunition. I settled into my bunker, well prepared for my next battle. At the park, I returned to Sarah. She paints her landscape under the washable eyes of the old timers in their white button down shirts and pork pie hats who are nearby playing checkers. On the canvas is a, one, a rendering of the Westlake theater sign across the street. I hear megaphone shouts from that direction and ask her what it might be about. It's the street preacher, she says. They show up by the bus load every Sunday. They used to wander through the park trying to convert everybody. She points to the men of the checkerboard. Those guys finally complained and they've been banished ever since. Like the sign says, no amplified sound. They have to preach from across the street now. Sarah laughs as she finishes the story and returns to her landscape while I hear a familiar challenge in the calls of the zealots. The Westlake Theater is now a swap meet, selling everything from counterfeit Levi's to paintings of Elvis on black velvet and dashboard statues of the Virgin Mary. Beyond it, is a rundown apartment house, and beyond that is a store selling bargain rate telephones and beepers. As I approach the corner of 6th Street and Alvarado, the preaching becomes louder, echoing off the walls of a nearby frozen yogurt shop. When the preachers see me, a white boy in jeans and a polo shirt, their slogans switch from Spanish to English. Accept the Lord Jesus as your savior. Worship no other than him. Let him take your life into his hand you will have the things you desire if you surrender to him. One of the zealots, a young man with dark eyes and slick black hair approaches me, megaphone at his side and Bible raised above his head. Hermano, he says, do you believe? I stare at him, his shirt is crisp and iron. His tie is obviously a, kip, a clip on. His chinos brush the tops of his polished brown Oxfords. I'm just going over to get a yogurt, I say. I point towards the shop. He smiles knowing me, knowingly at my indifference. Hermano, he says, let me prove to you that Jesus is Lord, that he is alive, that God exists. I try to resist the challenge, but I can't help myself. Why would you ever want to prove that God exists, I say? That wouldn't be a very good idea. His brow furrows as he takes the bait. Why is it a bad idea? I step closer to him. Well, just think about it. Isn't religion, all religion, based on faith, faith in the unknown, faith in the mystery, faith in the indefinable higher power? He nods his head and frowns, I, I suppose, he says. So I begin to shout at him. So if you define this higher power, if you prove that God exists, the mystery is solved and religion as you know it will die. And you, my friend, will be out of a job, or at the very least a hobby. 
His arms are limp now, Bible in his left hand, megaphone in his right. His eyes grow wide as he retreats a step. I finish him off with an ominous, on, ominous tone. To believe in the known requires little or no sacrifice, and sacrifice is the basis of faith, which itself is the cornerstone of religion. The zealot is slack-jawed slack now, and I silently revel in my victory. He looks to his comrades who are staring our way and then towards the shop. Then he hands me his Bible. I'm going to get a yogurt, he says. As he walks away, I hear him mumble his resignation. I quit, damn it, I quit. My work here is done. Sarcastic humor. Especially like they, I'm going to go get a yogurt. <laughs> Other questions, folks? Or comments? Amy, you're saying something, but I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I always do this. I, I said I've asked all of mine. <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> but I'm enjoying this. Don't, don't be fooled. Um, you had mentioned, I think in one of the email exchanges that, um, you, uh, it, you've been pretty consumed with like your duties as a professor. And I think you're also in administration yeah. somehow. Um, uh, yeah. And that, yeah. that's kind of <laughs> made an incursion into your writing life. Yeah. So. Um... <laughs> Uh, I'm good at avoiding things, I suppose, but um, <laughs> I teach primarily composition classes, and I've always found that. Uh, and we have a we have a five class workload here. Uh, it's pretty heavy. Um, I get one course release for uh, I I'm a co chair of of my my division, um, and I've always found that after reading student essays all day. Um, the last thing I want to do is sit down and write or even read something. Uh, and I'm trying to step back a little bit uh, and just, I just want to teach again. Um, but uh, the administrative work is, uh, is pretty time consuming. But um, hopefully that uh, that's going to relax a bit so I have time to do other things. And uh, I mean, it's time for me to, I think, do something creative again because I'm going crazy not not being creative or hiding from that. So um, we'll see what happens. Has the but pandemic had any effect on it on your writing? Uh, no, because I'm currently not doing much writing, um, and I. Uh, I've, I refuse to teach online classes. I won't do it. So I've done all face-to-face -face classes. I haven't gotten sick. I, I was immunized a month ago, but still with, uh, with all my classes face-to-face, -face, I, I never caught the bug. Um, I don't often get sick anyway. So uh, I wore a mask, but uh, it certainly affected uh, the mood uh, of the workplace. Um, and that, that's uh, been reflective and just kind of the, the attitude. I, I'm sure that's it's the same way um, every place else. But uh, I haven't thought much about writing since the COVID thing started. Um, so yeah, I'm immunized against everything, I suppose. <laughs> immunized against writing? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's a daily thing. Um, when you, I think I'm a creative person. Um, and I think you go through the day when you, when you have, uh, when you have priorities that you just have to do and accomplish it, you spend a good portion of every day, just chasing away ideas. I'll do that later. I'll do that later. Um, the projects that are sitting on my workbench, um, uh, at my house or, you know, everything from um, 
I want to build another guitar. I used to build guitars to uh, wrapping fishing rods and it just, um, yeah, I, I chase away stuff all the time, but uh, it's because I have work to do. But maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm using the work to not do anything. So, uh, yeah. We fool ourselves that way. It's a paradox. <laughs> I f do you find that unlike wrapping fishing rods or building guitars, when you push away an idea for writing, it goes cold? So even if you think about it again, it's just not got that same drive. The, to bad, I the bad ideas go cold. The good ideas grow. Cool. To the point where um, I have things in my head that I should have put down two years ago, but they just continue to grow. Um, and that's part of why I'm trying to step back a little bit so I can sit down and focus. Um, for me, um, writing takes uh, a particular focus. I can't do it at home. Um, any little distraction that takes me out of whatever is happening when I'm writing um, it just uh, just kills kills it and you kind of find yourself getting into a groove it's almost hypnotic sometimes I'm sure you know the feeling um, so I have to isolate myself I have to be away and alone I'm in my office right now um, and finding time to do that becomes difficult sometimes, so. So at least you don't, you're not sharing a teaching space with your wife or something like that. No, no. Um, that would be hard to be alone then and do your. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's just a no go. I, I have to, I have to be singular and alone and isolated for for anything to to come up of value um any distraction from the cat to kelly wandering through it uh, just it breaks whatever string is going so you don't write in coffee shops or something like that no i i've never done that um i might write a list of ideas but um no i never have done that display <laughs> so to speak i yeah i'm not a public writer i can't do that i find sometimes that kind of the clatter in the background sort of creates an isolating space for me but you have to be you have to have like total silence no no uh, silence is different i always have white noise on I always have white noise on. Um, one thing I don't do is uh, is turn music on because I listen too closely to music. But uh, for instance, in the office here, I'll I'll stream uh, um, uh, NPR. I, I stream NPR from Austin. I don't know why Austin, but uh, I always wanted to go to Austin, um, <laughs> Texas. So I stream their NPR. Um, every time I'm in the office and it just becomes white noise for me. Huh. Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't know why that works, but, it, but it, uh, it seems to make me able to focus on something uh, to have some clatter, like you said, going on in the background. A friend of mine recommends it's a soundtrack of a French bistro. It's just people talking and coffee clicking and stuff like that so that you could pretend you're actually A, in Paris, B, in a coffee shop, C, with actual humans as opposed to the cat who's been hitting my head with her tail for the past. Yeah. Um, and she she swears by it, so I might give it a try. Yeah. And PR has a lot also, of words in English that I would listen to. I also to. have CDs of uh, recordings of thunderstorms that I used to play, uh, Wolves. Um, that and, might affect your writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is so up. I, I've tried all kinds of white noise in the background. I, I, the only thing I know is, uh, yeah, music 
I'm a frustrated guitarist myself. I'm a terrible musician, but I listen very closely to music. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, uh, songwriters are the best short story writers. If you listen to uh, someone like Freddie Johnston, any of his albums, um, Patty Griffin, uh, mm -hmm. their stuff, just uh, what they can do in three minutes that we take half an hour to do is spectacular. Um, so I listen too closely. Uh, Regina just, Spector is that way. I think she, yeah. every song is like a short story. Yeah. And there are um, James McMurtry, Larry McMurtry's son, um, is a fantastic storyteller, but he does it in songs. So Did you hear that interview with him yesterday? With, with Larry McMurtry, and then at the end, he played some of James's uh, music? Uh, I didn't see, but I believe Larry McMurtry just didn't he just, he just died. Die? And so, yeah, so um, Fresh Air re-aired um, an interview with him. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I did not see that. they had a James song at the end, and I was pretty impressed. Yeah, he's a he's a terrific writer, lousy singer, but a terrific <laughs> writer. <laughs> My husband just said, "Look, Neil Young." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Leonard Cohen. Oh, yeah. Leonard Cohen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, My favorites of Leonard Cohen's are usually sung by somebody else. Um, so, Jennifer Warren's. Uh, the singer Jennifer Warren's had uh, an album out in the late 80s called Jenny. Well, uh, it's called Famous Blue Raincoat, but it was subtitled Jenny Sings Lenny, and he collaborated with her, and mm -hmm. um, she did a bunch of his songs. It's just a terrific album, um, and I don't think that's been repeated. Hmm. But, yeah, he was, he was a heck of a storyteller. Yeah. I think in his last few albums his voice is I mean it's so rough and ragged and not even yeah. really singing anymore that it's like a character in the song yeah <laughs> so here we go to <laughs> from writing to music I guess it's, oh. it's not that far mm -hmm. a stretch <laughs> no so I suppose you're not um, submitting anything since you're not, since you've been admitting. <laughs> uh, it's about time I started. Um, and I do think that uh, when I start publishing again, I'll, I'll go back to using my pseudonym. Um, Which is what? Pseudonym is uh, Inigo Jones. Who was? Uh, oh, I saw that on your yeah. Yeah, who was a, an architect? Uh, uh, he was a contemporary of Christopher Wren. Um, uh, did uh, everything from set designs for Shakespeare's plays, I think, or Shakespearean plays. Um, he was a little after Shakespeare, but uh, from set designs to uh, churches. Um, and I like the name because it's ambiguous. Um, you know, Jones is, you know, very ordinary and Inigo is a, a Spanish name, I believe. Um, now he was- you can't English. help but think of Inigo Montoya. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, th I don't know when Princess Bride came out, but I might've started using Inigo Jones Maybe around the same time, but I was I was an architecture student originally. Every all so, these new things keep coming up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I went back to school, I was going to finish a degree in architecture, um, and I just started writing and started getting some attention, and one thing led to another. But uh, I don't think I would have been a good architect. I just can't do the math. Hmm. So. Um, an important and I, part. probably in desperation, I switched to switch to English because um, people were wanting to print my stuff. So, uh, and now I'm an English professor. What the hell? There's no plan. It just <laughs> happens. <laughs> just follow your footsteps. <laughs> yeah. 
Any last uh, burning questions or comments that people have for Tom before we wrap it up? <laughs> well, Tom, I'd actually just like to thank you for saying that if an idea doesn't stick around, it's a bad idea because you've absolved me of any of the guilt that I have for not writing uh, because every idea I've had in the past two years has apparently been a bad one. Um, so, so you've solved my problem. Thanks for that. Glad to be of service. If it's a good one, it grows. Yeah. Bad ones disappear. So um, maybe they're still there. Have you thought about it? Apparently not well give, enough. Give us one. What's one idea before we go, Jen? What's one idea you have? Um, wow, damn, that's uh, that's too much pressure, I think. Um, clearly, right? See, bad ideas. There we go. <laughs> bad ideas. Yeah, I find that the ones that I think are good ideas but then grow cold are ones that were like a little too clever by half. It's kind of like there was something there that grabbed me and then it just, I couldn't really develop it and probably just because there just really wasn't more than that initial thing that grabbed me. There was nothing behind it. It's, uh, it's hard to make something out of it when it's kind of a quick, interesting thought, but kind of shallow. You know, if, you, if you're gonna build it into something, it has, to, it has to have some sort of dimension, I think, some sort of deep point that you're trying to wrestle with. If it's not there, um, uh, those are the ones that disappear. Sometimes I've tried to force them because I think, oh, it's such a good idea. And it just like doesn't go anywhere. So it's probably a good idea that I've let some <laughs> things just go cold. <laughs> yeah. For me, I see them as transitions. I, uh -huh. you know, the, those quick things that come and then you can't, like I, I'm a visual artist. So it's like I do the thing and then it doesn't go anywhere. I have no way to take it anywhere, but then it usually leads me to the next thing. So I yeah. just kind of, I, I have drawers and stacks of these things that are just not developed at all. But somehow I like them, you know, still, uh -huh. I still like them. So I don't know. They're like Christmas like ornaments. <laughs> you just hang them go back to them every once in a while once a year yeah. pull them out of the box yeah i'm with you lisa i think sometimes you have to write something or make something to get to the next thing you have to, it has to get out of the way but it there may be like a tiny seed of that thing that you thought was not very good or useful that carries you over i like that idea i remember in a workshop once the teacher said to me this was a good story to have written and gotten out of the way. And, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's true, right? It, it, and get I, it out I, of your system, <laughs> get it out of your system and move along. Um, yeah. But sometimes we do like them. I, I like my stuff too. Nobody else does, but I don't really care anymore. <laughs> That's the nice thing about getting old. It's like, screw you. <laughs> Sometimes it really takes a bit of distance. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Well, I think we will wrap this up before everybody gets Zoom fatigue. <laughs> zoom neck. <laughs> and yeah, well, Zoom thanks neck. For having me. It was it was fun to read this uh, this stuff again. It's been a while. So and Jen, thanks for asking. I appreciate it. It was fun to hear. So thanks for coming on and sharing with us. Thank you. Cheers and uh, everybody. have a good rest of the weekend. Yeah. You too. Bye, Thank everybody. Bye. Good seeing you, Jen Merrifield. <laughs> good seeing everybody. Yeah. Okay.